it just really, really makes you appreciate these men, what they stood for, that they were 10 years or more younger than I am right now, fighting, doing what they did on that island. I've always been fascinated with the history of World War II, and I think it may be because uh, when I was eight, nine, 10 years of age, we didn't have a television. All of the John Wayne movies about Iwo Jima and, and World War II in general were coming out. So I've just always really identified with World War II. The most important thing for me with this trip, I think what I keep thinking about is I've got a young son and I want him to have the same interest in this war and in these people that I have. And we were very fortunate not only to go, but to be able to go with veterans of the battle. I think that really makes it a once in a lifetime thing. With Iwo Jima, uh, it's so unique in World War II because of the numbers of casualties, the numbers of medals of honor that were given as a result of that battle. And of course, the most iconic thing of the whole trip to Iwo Jima is Mount Suribachi, the site of the flag raising and that amazing, amazing picture of that um, has endured for 64 years and will forever, no doubt. On February 19, 1945, a large armada of American warships and landing craft disgorged thousands of Marines and Navy personnel onto the beaches of Iwo Jima. It was the start of an assault that was generally felt would last no more than three or four days. For more than two months prior to the landing, attacks by U.S. fighters and bombers, as well as battleships offshore, had pounded the island day and night. By the time D-Day for Iwo came around, most U.S. personnel felt there could hardly be anyone left on the island alive. As they would soon learn, nothing could have been further from the truth. The island of Iwo Jima is little more than a tiny speck of volcanic sulfur, totally isolated roughly 700 miles south of Tokyo. Its name literally means Sulfur Island. It lies about the same distance from the island of Guam, which is south of Iwo Jima. Only about four miles long and two and a half miles wide at its north end, this barren wasteland in the vast Pacific would seem to have little significance on the planet. And that was true until the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor and the United States entered World War II in late 1941. In the final months of the war in early 1945, American B-29 bombers out of Guam flew firebombing missions over Tokyo and the island of Japan. Those flights went directly over Iwo Jima and were picked up on Japanese radar, which gave the mainland a two-hour warning of each impending bombing raid. Iwo had to be taken, not only to silence the radar warnings to Tokyo, but to provide a safe haven for damaged American bombers to land when they couldn't make it back to Guam. And so what would prove to be one of the most decisive battles in the history of the U.S. military began to unfold on the beaches of Iwo Jima in February 1945. In many ways, that battle came to define and symbolize World War II for Americans. And with the deaths of almost 7,000 U.S. soldiers during the 36-day battle, it forever became an enduring icon for the courage, loss, and pride of the U.S. Marines, who've never paid a higher price in battle before or since. 23 years after the island fell and the war ended in August of 1945, the United States ceded Iwo Jima back to the Japanese. The island is largely uninhabited today, and the Japanese have placed high restrictions on visits to Iwo. In fact, they allow only one plane load a year, one day a year, to visit. This is the story of one of those visits during the 64th anniversary of the battle and subsequent victory over the Japanese at Iwo Jima. For Ryan Pete and me, the journey began with Ryan's flight from his home in New York City to Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. There, the three of us connected on to Los Angeles where an initial orientation was scheduled at a hotel near LAX. We had an immediate crisis of sorts. Ryan's luggage didn't arrive when we did and he spent an hour or so on the phone trying to track it down. 
Though we were afraid it might be days before it caught up with us, it arrived about 10.30 that evening, a good sign and a big relief for Ryan. Our initial meeting with a number of people with whom we'd be traveling came shortly after our arrival at the hotel. Retired Marine Colonel Warren Weedhon heads up military historical tours, a Virginia company he founded in 1987 for the purpose of taking veterans back to battlefields they experienced as young people. The annual trip to Iwo Jima, though one of several he conducts, is uniquely appealing. It's like walking into Arlington Cemetery when you realize that you're walking on the graves of over 2,000 Japanese and 64 Americans. We also heard from Bob Perry, a veteran volunteer of these trips and a retired L.A. homicide detective. Bob had a unique ability to display authority and direction while being a genuinely nice guy. The highlight of the first get-together was being introduced to some of the veterans of the Iwo Jima battle. One was 90-year-old Tom Hodge of New Boston, Texas. His three adult daughters accompanied him for his first trip back to Iwo since he was a young man in his 20s. We took an immediate liking to all of them. They enjoyed every minute of the trip and were fun to be around. Another veteran, also 90 years old, was Cy O'Brien. With the zeal for life of a man 25 years younger, Cy was not only a veteran of the Iwo battle, but of these trips as well. He never missed an event the whole week we were in the Pacific. An unexpected treat awaited us at the departure gate at LAX the next morning. Uniformed TSA employees were singing patriotic songs in a special ceremony for our flight. They were very good. And we were told that while they shared this unique talent together, the next time we saw them, they might very well be going through our luggage at some airport security checkpoint. Their send-off set the perfect tone for the trip. Our Iwo veterans were introduced to everyone gathered at the gate, and Cy O'Brien came up with the perfect mix of humor and touching sentimentality. People never made this much fuss over me when I got married. <laughs> It is so great to see you. You know, seeing you all here <clears throat> realize, makes me realize what America is all about. We are all one. We all have the same feeling. We all have the same debt. It is so wonderful to be together with you. Still pumped from that rousing ceremony at LAX, we faced a five-hour flight to Honolulu, a two-hour refueling stop, then another seven and a half hours to Guam. En route, we gained a day, but still arrived after dark at our headquarters hotel, the Outrigger Guam. As we topped the escalator, young people in native costume gave us an enthusiastic welcome. Shortly thereafter, we headed for our rooms and some much-needed sleep. Our first full day on Guam began with a briefing after breakfast and a breakdown of what the day and week would hold in store. After a few comments, staff introductions, and a video, we boarded buses and began the first of several exploratory trips around Guam. Students of the war in the Pacific know that Guam, inhabited for centuries by the Chamorans, came under Spanish control in 1565 and remained that way for more than 300 years. Following the end of the Spanish-American War, the U.S. claimed Guam as a territory in 1898. It was quickly realized Guam's deep opera harbor 
and the island's general location made it of strategic interest to the United States militarily. But by 1931, Japan had begun an aggressive expansion throughout the hemisphere and Guam was one of many islands in Japan's sights. Ten years later, the U.S. Congress imposed sanctions against the Japanese and tensions increased. By November of 1941, the Navy was evacuating U.S. personnel and interests. Shortly thereafter, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor and within hours, Guam was under Japanese control. It would be almost four years before Guam was liberated by U.S. forces, and to accomplish that, some of the fiercest fighting in the Pacific was experienced on Guam. Today, the island has returned to its pre-war beauty, but without many of the original buildings or Spanish influence that marked the island for so long. To U.S. veterans who fought on Guam, the memories easily returned to the consciousness. Red Beach to Chinita Cliff is right here. I fought there. Chinita Cliff, isn't that something? There is a suppressed desire to return to where you were so affected in your life. Let's face it, combat is the, mo is the singular most dramatic, traumatic thing that could possibly happen to an individual. So it's always there. It's always in the back of your mind. Though Cy O'Brien had fought on Bougainville as an infantryman, he later became a war correspondent and journalist, and that was his position during heavy fighting on Guam. I was there, I was covering it, and the, some of the very first fighting was on Chinita Ridge. In fact, I went right into it, and it was an area I was covering. I watched this fight, I saw him go up, I saw him fall down. They, 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 they had to go up straight, and they had to grab by their hands and, and, and hold on, and they couldn't sometimes, and they were shot and fell down. It was a bitter, bitter, bitter fight. And, and to be able to see where these men fought for our freedom was something I'll never forget. On this trip, there were numerous opportunities to do just that. At one of the primary invasion beachheads, a memorial to the men who fought and died was erected in 1994 marking the 50th anniversary of the Allies retaking Guam. It was a natural place for both Cy and Tom to pose for pictures at the urging of others on our tour. The nearby beaches, which saw terrible fighting so long ago, now seem timeless and quiet, the silence broken only by wind and waves. Our visits to the high points of Guam's military history were spread over several days, and we had excellent and knowledgeable guides at every turn. Flags of former bitter enemies now fly together in the trade winds which constantly pass over the island. Our informal lectures frequently took us just yards away from the location of some of the most intense fighting on Guam in 1944. And though it's been nearly two-thirds of a century, reminders of the conflict are never far away. Our tour guides had also arranged for us to see and learn about the Chamoran culture side of Guam, the largest, most populous, and southernmost of the Mariana Island chain. A lunch stop in a small village provided an up-close, personal glimpse of what is still a simpler way of life on Guam. Swaying palms and the beauty of the ocean made a good backdrop for some photography and a light lunch, and we didn't lack for conversation. Earlier in the day, one of our volunteer guides, Vietnam veteran John Edwards, was taken a bit by a water buffalo, something he had seen many times in Vietnam, and something Ryan came to learn about firsthand. For Pete, Ryan, and me, aviation enthusiasts all, one of our favorite stops on Guam came late in the week with a visit to Anderson Air Force Base. This facility has played a key role in America's defense strategy for many decades. Young Air Force pilots with responsibilities hard to imagine were very approachable and answered our questions about their jobs and seemed honored to pose with some of our EWO veterans. And we did a little posing of our own. We had about 30 minutes of a fascinating demonstration of military guard dogs working closely with their handlers. The dogs' training levels were impressive, if 
only humans were half as focused. And point in passing, I determined right off that most of us could never outrun one of these four-legged guys. Though we started the tour under the nose of an aging B-52 whose flying days are past, the latest of the U.S. arsenal can be found at Anderson. This F-22 Raptor was one of several we saw taking off and landing periodically. And there were four B-2 stealth bombers at Anderson like these. We watched them from a distance and then to our surprise, we got to stand within about eight feet of one for an extended period of time. The pilots answered most of our questions and though we were not allowed to take our cameras anywhere near the B-2, an Air Force photographer took this picture which we were all very pleased to receive in the mail a couple of weeks after we returned home. On one of the mornings before a Guam tour, there was a large gathering and symposium of sorts with all of our Iwo vets at the center of attention. In what must have seemed surreal to some of the vets making their first trip back, the audience included Japanese veterans as well. A number of them would accompany us on the flight to Iwo. Retired Marine General Fred Haynes, highest ranking in the room, spoke of his experiences on Iwo Jima. Though in his late 80s and physically frail, his mind is clear and sharp, and his book, The Lions of Iwo Jima, served as our primary source of research in the weeks leading up to the trip. We were honored to have him sign each of our copies, and I know the personalized books will remain treasured keepsakes from our Iwo Jima experience. And then, it was almost time for that experience. The main reason most of us made this trip. When we leave tomorrow and head for Iwo Jima, the plane will be boisterous, everybody will be talking. But the minute that Iwo Jima comes into sight, the plane will be quiet. And the veterans, most of the veterans will have a tear in their eye because what they're doing is reflecting back on that moment when they were down on those sands. It was a short night. We'd been instructed to be in the hotel lobby by 3 a.m., ready to board buses shortly thereafter for the airport and our charter flight to Iwo. Rather than dwelling on how little sleep we'd had, most everyone seemed to be anxious to get underway, to begin that final leg of the journey, which for some in the group had begun almost a lifetime ago. We boarded buses for the short drive to the airport, and an hour later, we had all cleared security and were awaiting the flight. There's only one departure gate in the world that displays this destination, and it displays it for only a couple of hours, one day a year. While the three of us were excited, we couldn't help but wonder what was going through the minds of those who had lived through the Iwo battle, as one by one they boarded the aircraft, heading back. We soon followed. As Warren Wheathon had predicted, the mood was generally light as people made their way down the aisles to their seats. One quiet and somewhat poignant moment for me came with a glance to the tarmac outside my window. Baggage handlers were loading wheelchairs. How different this arrival would be for the veterans from that first time they set foot on the island 64 years ago. And then in pre-dawn darkness, the lights of Guam fell away as the plane climbed into the sky for the two-hour flight to Iwo Jima. This is so isolated and so remote, and to have the opportunity to do a trip like this um, was once in a lifetime experience, hopefully not, but it's just one of those things that you know is a unique opportunity. This was, Iwo Jima was something that we had always been on our list, something that we wanted to, uh, to take off and see. And one day I just asked my dad, uh, you know, we, we had talked about this battle for a long time, and one day I just said, well, what, what does it take to get there? It's gonna be kind of sad, I think. And, uh, it's just, uh, it's like somebody asked me how, how I was going to feel when I see those Japanese there, and I don't know. My doctor started this. He always said, well, I was in the office, he said, you ever think about going back to Iwo Jima? I, I said, no, not really in shape. I mean, I said, I wouldn't dare. He said, I'll tell you, Jim, so if you go back, I'll go back with you. A number of times I've been back with them. I find that uh, some of them have said that they want to come back to see where they were 18 years old, 17 years old. Uh, just to pay respects to the brothers and buddies they served with that didn't make it back. Now, I don't need to do this. I'll be 80 next month. Uh, I could have retired a long time ago. So what drives us to do this passion, uh, satisfaction, seeing the veterans satisfied, 
taking it back to the battlefield through the foxhole. Midway through the flight, the sun burst over the eastern horizon and underscored the feeling in the cabin that Iwo was drawing near. We were told that flight crews actually bid on this trip, considering it an honor to escort these veterans back to a pivotal point in their lives. This attendant told us it was the highlight of her year, and this was her ninth time to work the annual journey. In a bit of irony, perhaps, the early morning sun evoked an inevitable comparison to the Japanese rising sun flag of World War II. And then, with passengers straining for a look outside, and a descending aircraft passing through an expanse of cotton candy clouds, a remarkable sight. Iwo Jima came into view. Okay, folks, we have a communication problem up here. We're coming right across Iwo right now, so we are going to go out and uh, make a full circle to the left, and then we'll do it uh, again to the right. The pilots had told us earlier that they'd make several figure eights over the island before landing, so passengers on both sides would get a view. We all found it to be an almost indescribable moment. You read about it, you see documentaries, you see footage, you see pictures. You, you learn as much as you can, especially when you're going on a trip like this. But I cannot put into words what it was like to look out that plane window and set eye, my own two eyes, um, on the island of Iwo Jima, it was something I will never, ever forget. Now, a final approach and touchdown on the island of Iwo Jima. As we taxied in, there was a small contingent of Japanese military on hand, but it was clear there would be no formal welcoming ceremony. After leaving the plane, we turned over our passports and were ushered into a large empty hangar to await a series of small buses that would take us to several key areas of Iwo. Regrettably, the three of us were separated for much of the tour from the veterans we had accompanied, but we later saw glimpses of their moments on Iwo. Finally, we left the hangar and within moments caught our first brief look at Suribachi in the distance. Within minutes, we came upon a relic of the battle, a rusted hulk of an American Sherman tank. Tanks played a vital role in the actual battle through their use of flamethrowers, an important weapon once the Marines determined that the Japanese were dug into miles of subterranean tunnels. Well, my only point of reference of, of the island was what I'd seen in uh photographs and video from 1945 and we have been told that the island had changed a lot since that time that when you see the the old film there's virtually no vegetation no green no nothing and there was actually quite a bit of grass and and vegetation and everything so it looked a little bit different than what I expected. Our first official stop on Iwo would be the heart of what defines the island for most of us the top of Mount Suribachi and the site of the two flag raisings the second of which was immortalized in the photo. During the ascension, we began to see image slivers of the landing beaches below, and in only minutes, we arrived at the summit, the vantage point from which so many Marines were fired upon during the initial landings and assault. No higher than the Washington Monument, Suribachi still provided a tactical advantage for the Japanese until it fell to the Marines on D plus four. It was hard to believe we were there. We were Disappointed to learn we'd only have 20 minutes to take our pictures and view the island from its highest point. Scarcely time to accomplish that and in no way affording a moment for reflection on what it all meant. Still, as we focused our attention and our camera lenses on the scene and a small memorial to the Marines who paid so high a price for taking this otherwise insignificant hill, we tried, mentally at least, to slow the experience down.
stick in my mind, I think, even more than Sarabachi, mainly because when I turned around and looked at it, it looked exactly like I had seen in the films, were the actual beach, uh, Green Beach down there, where, where, the, where the Marines first came onto the shore. And the sand looked exactly like it did with Sarabachi in the background, and it was that black sand, and it was sort of sloped in a berm. And it looked like the old photographs. Shortly after leaving the summit of Surabachi, we were making our way down to the beaches. As Ryan had mentioned, we found more vegetation than we would have expected. Almost immediately, we came across a Japanese bunker, still largely intact and holding the rusted remains of a machine gun. It was not hard to imagine the kind of havoc that pillbox and its enemy soldiers could have rained down on advancing Marines during the early morning hours of the assault on Iwo. Pete posed for a picture inside the bunker. In the distant shores of the north and east side, waves pounded high cliffs, cliffs that assured the actual combat landings would take place where we were, on the open, generally flat areas of the lower east side of the island. From any point on these beaches, Suribachi looms, quiet, non-threatening, and dormant but always there. What you always hear about are the sands of Iwo Jima. It's the, the type of sand, the volcanic black sand, the coarse sand, and getting to hold that in my hands and fill up a bottle of it and get it to bring it back to the States to give to loved ones, um, former soldiers, and just uh, people that will really, truly appreciate it. It's one of the most unique keepsakes of any trip that you'll ever take. And I think that's gonna really stick in my head from my experience of, of being on the island and just almost as an experiment, we, uh, we thought we would try just to, to run up that slope and just see how difficult it was. And we had a little bit of camera equipment on us, but of course we didn't have the 80 pounds of uh, gear and weaponry that the Marines would have had. And even at that, it was so difficult just to get up that, that berm. And that's not to mention the fact that we weren't getting, getting shot at. Eons of Pacific surf on these beaches on either side of the 36-day battle have left the island largely unchanged, remote, and strangely foreboding. Without personally experiencing it as so many American fighting men did, one can only imagine the carnage, the chaos, the pain, and the cruel death that greeted thousands of U.S. Marines in this spot 64 years ago. I live at Green Beach One, which is right at the base of the mountain. And they were looking right down on us and firing right down on us. They said it would be a three-day operation. But they didn't realize, they'd been bombing it, you know, and uh, they didn't realize that all those caves there, that the Japs were not on Iwo Jima, they were in Iwo Jima, underground. Shells were falling everywhere, you know, and guys were getting at him, you get there hauling. In fact, when we landed there, when the ramp went down, we started to run out. Well, my best buddy was on this side. He ran out one side on the right side. I ran out the left. And I just, we'd been talking there. I told him, I'll see, see you tonight there, you know, everything. And he was killed on the way up uh, the first, uh, well, about the first two hours there. And the thing I remember, <laughs> very climactic to the whole battle, I think, was one day, about the 26th something of very late in March, I remember seeing three or four giant army trucks. And they were loaded with bodies like cordwood. They were the 350 or 400 Japanese who had made the last attack against the Marines. Later on, we found out about how important Iwo Jima was to uh, uh, the United States as a landing area for crippled airplanes <coughs> coming back from Japan that couldn't make it back to Guam. As I understand it, by taking that island, we, we saved about 20-some thousand airmen from, from a, a horrible death, knowing that there was no place to go. Uh, that's what it was worth. It was worth that. Yeah. 
The trip each year is capped by a joint Japanese and American ceremony honoring those who fought during the battle for the island. The solemn event included remarks by General Haynes and others from both sides. General Tatamishi Kurabayachi, who commanded the Japanese during the Iwo battle and died on the island during the battle, was represented by his grandson, who also spoke. It was a time for reuniting old soldiers. The battle for Iwo Jima raged for 36 days. Almost 30,000 lives were given in combat, more than 6,800 of them American. But a defining moment for U.S. troops, and indeed for Americans everywhere, came on the 23rd of February, the fourth day of fighting. A small contingent of Marines and Navy personnel secured Suribachi and planted a small American flag. A while later, a second, larger flag replaced the first. A 33-year-old civilian photographer, Joe Rosenthal, in one four hundredth of a second, snapped a picture of the second flag raising. Within 48 hours, it was on the front page of newspapers all over the world. It earned the Pulitzer Prize, and an icon for all time was born. But for American soldiers fighting on Iwo, it was little more than a moment to feel pride before continuing the fight. We watched the flag raised, and then when it was raised, the word came down from the top that we could turn and go back to, to the first airstrip and set up the big black area. I didn't see it go up, but I saw it just a few minutes after it went out. My buddy said, one of my buddies was out by me, he said, Tom, look up on the mountain. I looked up there and old Rory was waving. It felt good. I watched it. Somebody said, something going on in Suribachi on the top of it, you know. So being the machine gun crew, I had binoculars. And I looked, took my binoculars out and looked, and I could see that that little flag went up. And then they took it down and uh, put up the bigger one in. I, I, got, I got a real tingle when some, uh, uh, someone hit me and says, oh, Brian, look. And I looked up and I saw that flag go up. I did get impressed by that. And believe it, even today, it's a funny thing. When I see that flag, I think of that. Three of the six flag raisers died within days after the photo was taken. Around the world, many assumed the battle was over, but bitter and costly fighting would continue another four weeks. The National Museum of the Marine Corps, a world-class facility in Quantico, Virginia, is the repository of both flags raised on Mount Suribachi that day. Enshrined forever, they are alternately displayed in a sealed environment within the museum. Since 1954, an enormous memorial to the Marines and their sacrifices on Iwo Jima and elsewhere has drawn millions to quiet contemplation next to Arlington Memorial Cemetery in Washington, D.C. And it all started on an insignificant, tiny island in the remote Pacific Ocean, where individual men, charged with preserving freedom, rose with exceptional courage and seized a moment in time. Yeah, I just always, always loved history, and just to know the, what I enjoy and the freedoms I enjoy and the life that I get to lead is truly based on the foundation that these guys set for us. And I hope that I'm able to go back there someday. I certainly have a goal already to try and get my son there uh, with me one day, but the one thing that I don't think we'll be able to do is to take the veterans, um, is to be going there with veterans of the battle, so that's what made it really special. We're told that World War II veterans are dying at the rate of 1,000, 1,200 a day, which is almost inconceivable. So to be able to make this trip with these men who fought there as 17, 18 year old kids, and many of them were returning for the first and only time, and likely the last time since they were there 64 years ago. Um, it just really made it very, very special for all of them.